once again to the book of Haggai and to um, our second stint uh, in the book of Haggai, verses uh, uh, 5 through 11 uh, we come to uh, this time. So if you would like to uh, follow the reading uh, with me, if you would turn please to the book of Haggai and uh, to chapter 1. We all take up the reading at verse 1 and we'll read to the end of the chapter. Haggai chapter 1 and verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Josedek the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe ye, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to be put into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountain, and bring wood. And build a house, and I will take pleasure in it. And I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Ye look for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why? saith the Lord of hosts. Because of mine house there is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labour of the lands. Then Zerubbabel said, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts their God. In the four and twentieth day of the sixth month, in the second year of the rise of the king. Thus far we read in God's holy and infallible word. Coming to Haggai's prophecies, um, chapter one uh, consists of the first of four prophecies in uh, two short tra chapters, but of course full of, um, well, good stuff, stuff applicable, relevant for uh, Haggai's people back in the day, about approximately 500 years before Christ, but of course just as relevant for us today as we shall see. Consider your ways. Uh, this is our second take on that theme as we look at verses 5 through 11 here today. Uh, Haggai has given them uh, the analysis of their situation, not his analysis, mark you, but God's analysis of their situation, what actually lies the back of it, the cause that is. And having given them, delivered to them, God's analysis, again, not his own, not his take, God's take on the matter, and interprets it to them, brings the word of God to them, he then begins to challenge them. Consider your ways. Because it's not externals that are the problem, which maybe perhaps some of God's people uh, would bring up as 
Well, maybe they would today. Um, economic downturn, international turmoil, enemies at the gate all around them. But are those external forces? Are they not? Um, are they not the same today as as back then? Aren't they always the same? Do not God's people have enemies at the gate all the time seeking to undermine and seeking to hinder and hold back the work of God, the cause of God? And is there not always international turmoil of some kind or another? And of course, well, when it comes to economic uh, downturn, have we not got that today uh, as a result of the present pandemic, pandemic worldwide? So, but these were not the problems, the external forces. The people may have claimed that, but that's no excuse. The problem is um, what they need to do is to deal with the cause and not the effect. So often in our lives, we want the effects to be taken away. We want uh, the misery to be taken away. Uh, we want the, um, the effects of our sin to be taken away but we are very reluctant um, to, do, uh, to deal with it, to go to the cause, to dig down to the root of the matter and deal with the root of the matter, deal with the cause. So Haggai, he's calling on God's people to do that very thing. He's opening up, he's exposing their sin and he's showing them the root of the matter, the cause, the cause of their problems. They've been building their own houses. Nothing wrong with that. Sealed houses, panelled, all finished, done and dusted. Luxurious, nice. But the house of God lies in waste. And so um, uh, what they need to understand is, you see, they've gotten into this way of thinking that the church is, well, the house of God, that is, um, you know, is... is well, it doesn't really matter, you know, it's just a, it's just an earthly thing. Uh, but Haggai would have them to know different. Because the temple lies waste, lies in ruin, the house of God lies in ruin. So therefore there's no corporate worship. So that shows, that reveals something deeper down. Um, that is that there's no desire for corporate worship and therefore no desire for God. So our lives, you see, are not compartmentalized. You know, it's, um, you know, uh, Jesus Christ is Lord of all, as we say, or he's Lord of nothing at all. He's Lord on Sundays and he's Lord on Mondays. He's Lord in the house of God and he's Lord out of it. Every aspect of our lives are under his rulership and under his gaze. So Haggai has exposed their sin, he's brought it out, and he calls them, challenges them to repent, to consider their ways, and to repent, and to obey God's call to take care of and to get on with the building of God's house. He's calling for action, he's calling for motion. Motion is the sign of life. If there is no motion, then what conclusion do you come to? That there is no life. He's calling for action. He's calling for motion. He wants them moving in the way that is of repentance, renewed faith, and obedience, covenant faithfulness and obedience in the building of God's house. Their world view, their thinking, their psyche is what needs changing. That's what the word repentance, in fact, means. Isaiah, he puts it this way, chapter 55 and 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. You change the unrighteous man's thoughts and you change his ways. It's the thinking, wrong thinking, that leads to the wrong ways. Proverbs 23 and verse 7, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. If he thinks wrong, his way is wrong. The people's ways are wrong because their thinking is wrong. So Haggai seeks to correct their thinking, which will in turn 
alter their ways. Consider your ways. So it's a call for new obedience and, um, and of course this comes to them through Haggai the prophet because of God's infinite love for his people. He will not let his people go and he will not leave them in this state condition of apathy and indifference difference to his covenant, to his cause and to his house. He will have them up and moving in action again, showing and evidencing the life in them that he has put there. It's his love that, for his people that motivates God thus to act. So we've got three things here. We've got the self-examination, verses 5 through 5 and 6. The second call, verses 7 and 8. And the secondary cause, verses 9 through 11. The self-examination, verses 5 and 6. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe ye, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, er, um, uh, earneth wages to put them in a bag with holes. They've built their, ha their houses, their own homes, their own panelled houses, all finished, done and dusted, but God's house lies in waste. And because of this, as we shall see, because of this, there's drought, there's famine, there's a complete downturn in the economy, in their circumstances, in their community in Judah, in Israel. So the sin is a sin of omission. It's not something they've done. There's nothing wrong with them building their houses and even having nice houses. Nothing wrong with that at all, if we can afford nice houses. The sin is not one of commission, it's one of omission. They're omitting something. They're leaving something out. They're leaving the house of God out. They're leaving the corporate worship out. And so therefore they're leaving God out. They would confess to be God's people. They would confess to be covenant children of God, to believe in God, but they're living, they're living as if there was no God. And God will not leave them that way. Now they were warned about this back in Moses. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 38. They shall carry much seed out into the field, and shall gather but little in, for the locust shall consume it. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but shalt neither drink of the wine, nor gather the grapes, for the worm shall eat them. Thou shalt have olive trees through all thy coasts, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with the oil, for thine olive shall cast his fruit. This is the very thing that's come upon them, that Moses warned them about. But again, you see, the issue is not external factors. This is the excuse that we would make. It's not time to build God's house because, well, because of external forces, external circumstances. Whatever it might be today, in your circumstances, in their day, enemies at the gate all around them, disturbing them, harassing them international turmoil and um, economic downturn. So it's not time, it's not, this isn't the right time to get on with the, the house of God, to build the house of God. But it's not, the, the, the externals are just an excuse. It's not the external forces, it's the inner condition of the people's hearts. There's no desire. There's no desire to build the house of God. There's no desire to be meeting together in the house of God. And so therefore, we have to conclude there is no desire for God himself. Now, when it comes to prosperity, um, prosperity or poverty, well, we can't take either, either to be a blessing or to be a curse, you know? Um, Prosperity. Some people say that prosperity, even for the ungodly, for the wicked, is a sign of God's grace. 
Well, we don't think so. I mean, look at Job. Job was bereft of everything. Of course, with hindsight, we know why. He was being attacked by the evil one, but, but that there were things going on in heavenly places that he wasn't aware of, but he was stripped of everything, even his family. So if, if prosperity, health and wealth, abundance, is grace towards the wicked, well, what was that towards Job? A curse. And then, of course, you've got Asaph in Psalm 73. He made this mistake too. Uh, he says in verse 3, Psalm 73, For I was envious of the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He was envious. They are being blessed. God's being gracious to them. But what about me? I cleanse myself in vain, he says. Until that is. God took him into the sanctuary and showed him the reality of the matter. Verse 18, Surely thou didst set them in slippery places, thou castest them down into destruction. It wasn't grace, it wasn't blessing to the prosperous wicked at all. It was a curse to them, the very, the very opposite. But this is why the people in Haggai's day needed the prophet and needed the word of God. And why we need to bring our circumstances, whatever they might be, whether it's prosperity or whether it's poverty or anything else. Your circumstances, your circumstances do not determine either blessing or curse. It is to be brought our circumstances um, the people in Haggai's day, their circumstances need to be brought to the word of God. And so Haggai, he comes. God sends him to interpret the providence, the sovereign providence of God in their time. If God is gracious, I ask you, if God is being gracious to the wicked and giving them prosperity, then what is he giving to his elect child of God who is poverty stricken, who can't pay his or her bills, uh, her mortgage, is out of a home, is on the street. If they have no wealth, if they have no, 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 if they have no health, what about the young mother um, inflicted with, can with terminal cancer? But the wicked, prosperous and wealthy, beaming with health, is that a blessing? Is that grace toward them? If you come to that conclusion, then you have to say that elect child of God, that mother stricken with cancer, well, is God cursing her? Not at all. Whatever our circumstances might be, yeah, through the New Testament lens, Whatever our circumstances might be, whether it be prosperity or whether it be poverty, God promises, Romans 8, verse 28, he promises that all things, all things shall work together for the good of those whom he has chosen. Grace. Grace is sovereign. Grace is particular. Grace is ours. Grace belongs to the people of God. It belongs to one nation. And that one nation is the church. If we turn over to um, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Not Israel, the Israel of God, okay? But yet a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That nation, that one nation, grace belongs to the grace of God. And Israel, here in the Old Testament, is a figure of that church, of that one nation. That nation of 1 Peter 2 verse 9. So blessing is not always and ever. Wealth, prosperity, is not necessarily always a sign of blessing. It's not, God's blessing is not to the wealthiest, it's to the faithful. It's to the covenant faithful. It's to the obedient. 
And if you walk in covenant faithfulness to God, if you walk in obedience to God, whether as an individual or as a church corporately, well, that can cause you, that could cause you poverty. You could be afflicted with poverty because of that. You could, it could cause you to be not the biggest swelling congregation, but the tiniest in all the land, in all your country. Maybe just a, a small handful of you. In fact, it may cause you more trouble than enough. Simply and only why? Because you're faithful to God's covenant, to God's house, you continue on regardless of the circumstances, external circumstances, you continue on to build the house of God. And it causes you trouble. So you see, you see, just because there's wealth, and just because there's a big swelling congregation, and the money's flowing in, that, and, and there's no trouble. That's not necessarily a sign of blessing. What we are looking for, what we are looking for now, is for spiritual health. What are you feeding your souls on? The flesh pots of this world? The things of this world? What are you feeding your souls on television-wise, internet-wise, entertainment-wise? And your children, your covenant children that you're seeking to rear up, what are they watching you watching? Because what you're watching, they are watching you ever so closely and they see whether you approve or disapprove and if you approve of it, then they will approve it, and further down the line, they will commit themselves to it, they will do it, all because you approved of it. You approve of the fornication, they get it, it's good to go. You approve of the sodomy, they get it, it's good to go. Nothing wrong with it, mum and dad have no problem with it. What kind of legacy are you leaving for your children, I ask you? What we ought to be doing is, we ought to be teaching them God's word. We ought to be instructing them in the way of covenant faithfulness and obedience to the Lord. The business in every generation of building the house of God. And calling and calling the flesh what it is, the flesh, and that the flesh in any shape or form is unacceptable to God and unacceptable to the covenant community. So what are you feeding your souls on? Can you expect to be feeding your soul on the things of the world and then come to the house of God on the Lord's day? And then wonder why you've got no spiritual appetite? What kind of clothes are you wearing? Is it the Armani? Is it the Gucci? Is it the skinny jeans with holes in the knees? Or is it the royal, righteous robes of Jesus Christ clothed and walking in his righteousness? That's what it should be. Consider your ways. Consider your ways, says the prophet, says the Lord. Secondly, the second call, verses 7 and 8. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build a house and I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. So call for action to be building because building the house of God, you say, well, it's only bricks and mortar, you know. It's only a building, so what, you know. But you see, they starting the rebuilding again, they started it 16 years previously when they came back from Babylon. Oh, they were all gung-ho then, you know. Then bit by bit they fell away, 
they realized just how hard and laborious uh, the job was and eventually they gave up and just concentrated on their own houses. That was 16 years ago. But should they move, should they act upon the prophecy brought to them and they begin to rebuild the temple, the house of God, well that would be evidence, wouldn't it? That would be evidence of repentance. That would be evidence of desire for, not just for the house of God, but for God himself. We know we understand God is not dependent on magnificent buildings. Look at chapter 2 and verse 3. Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Those amongst them who perhaps saw the temple back in Solomon's day. Oh, it was glorious. It was magnificent. It was wonderful. And they're saying, hey, look at this heap of rubbish, yeah? You think this is a temple? This is nothing, you know? But it's not the magnificence of the building that matters. That matters nothing. It's what takes place inside the building, the corporate worship of God. We've got cathedrals here in the United Kingdom that go back to the year dot. They are magnificent, I tell you. They are so well looked after. The money just keeps piling in because, well, they charge you money to get inside and see the places. They're dripping with money. And oh, they are beautiful. People visit them from all over the world. And they stand amazed. Look at these buildings. Aren't they wonderful? Oh. But oh, do they see? Do they have the spiritual eyes to come on a Sunday and see what takes place in these cathedrals? Apostate religion the gospel, the life-giving gospel of Jesus Christ, him crucified, dead, buried, and raised again, long, long gone from these cathedrals. They're just empty shells of what they once were. Think about Jacob, will you, in Haran, yeah? He's lying on the dust, he's lying on the ground, sleeping overnight, and he's got a rock behind him for his pillow. And he says, this is what he says, Genesis 28, verse 17. He wakes up and he says, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. He's not even in a building. With a rock for his pillow. But the work isn't glamorous either. They've got to go up to Lebanon and get more wood. They've got to dress the stones. They've got to make the cement. It's graft. They've got to get the sleeves rolled up. It's hard work. But building the house of God's always been hard work. It always will be. It is today. It's hard graft. It's, it's plodding. It's keeping on, keeping on, keeping on. In the way of the covenant, it's not your flash concerts, you know, with your rock and roll gospel, with your flashing lights and smoke machines and the, all the fancy musical instruments and, and all the beautiful, talented, gifted singers. Now, half of them probably, probably don't even know the Lord. The backward preacher, some country, some country church, you know, an old wooden shack maybe, you know, and it's fallen to bits. But there he is, week after week, year in, year out, 40, 50 years, faithfully preaching the word of God. And a small company of people with him, maybe half a dozen, a dozen, but they're there faithfully, Lord's Day by Lord's Day, and they're building the house of God. Faithful. Preaching God's word, administering faithfully the, the sacraments and exercising discipline amongst themselves. Uh, worship services conducted in some, some dirty prison cell in Iraq. Huh? Christians in Siberia, Tim Cassie of Frontline Missions, tell, I, I, I heard them say on one occasion about friends of his in Siberia 
and they have a baptism and they have to walk through this forest through snow for two hours to get to the lake, break the ice, baptize the child of God and then walk back two hours back through the forest. Faithfulness, covenant faithfulness, obedience, yeah? In spite of the external circumstances, China, pastors in, in hiding, secret meetings, because they face prison years and years in prison if they're caught conducting services, faithful services, faithful to the word of God. What is it that makes, whether it's a shack or whether it's a big building, might be a fine, might be a nice building, but what is it that makes it glorious? It's not all the trappings, it's not the light, it's not the instruments, it's nothing physical, it's the glory, it's the Shekinah glory, it's the presence of the Lord of hosts amongst them, amongst the people that are doing that which pleases him. And what pleases him is that they walk in the covenant walk in the way of day by day repentance and faith, obedience to the covenant of God. Reforming themselves in doctrine. Church of England here is deforming itself. They're having consultations. They're having contemplations and prayers about bringing into their midst same-sex marriage. No. They're not reforming, they are deforming. But of course you don't have to go there uh, to find that. You find that in evangelical ministries and churches, do you not, throughout the West. From here, the United Kingdom, right across North America. One after the other, folding, giving in to this sodomite marriage. Reformation of doctrine, but reformation of life too. When we talk about reformed doctrine, you know, people think the head, the head, the head. Too much of the head, not enough of the life, spiritual life. We need a baptism in the Holy Ghost. We need the Spirit of God to fall upon our sound doctrine, reformed doctrine. It's not one or the other, it's both. A baptism in the Holy Spirit is what the Reformed Church needs today. It's the presence, the glorious, mighty, powerful presence of God. That's what makes, that's what makes the house of God glorious. What he accepts, what God accepts, David tells us, Psalm 51, Verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Philippians 1, verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. Here back in Haggai's day, most of the temple stuff was gone. The Ark of the Covenant was gone, the candelabra would be gone, all this stuff was gone. But that's good, you see. That's a good thing. Maybe perhaps God is weaning them off the physical stuff. That's what brought them to exile. Idolatry. The temple, the temple. We've got the temple. Everything's okay. God's still with us. We've got the Ark of the Covenant there in the temple. It's okay. God's still with us. Physical things. Jeremiah said to them, say not temple, temple, temple. Because God had long gone from the temple because of their idolatry, their worship of physical things. So maybe here, this is the point at which God is weaning them from the physical post-exile. Yeah. Because Israel, after the exile, the exile cured them. After that, they never went back to their idolatry. But maybe God is pointing them, pointing them towards the coming Christ, the Son of God, 
who will tell Israel that those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth, not through physical things. Because Christ is the real builder of the house of God. Not Zerubbabel, not the people of Israel, not you, not me. Jesus Christ, he's the one whom Haggai is prof prophesying about. It's not about the temple, it's about the temple builder. And Jesus Christ is the one who says, I will build my church. Both in the Old Dispensation and the New Dispensation, he is the builder of the house of God. Ephesians 2 verse 20, And they're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the buildings fitly framed together, Groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom also ye are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. For a habitation of God, God's dwelling place amongst his covenant people. And living and working together in building, building God's house alongside our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ loving God with all our heart, soul, strength and mind and loving the brethren, that's the cement that bonds us together as the people of God. And so this is the second call. Verse 5, the first one, consider your ways. Verse 7, the second call, consider your ways. Because sometimes we can be a tad spiritually deaf. And God needs to call again. And then he needs to call again so that we get it. Yeah? Like Abraham, you know. Abraham had to be called twice. God called him out of Ur of the Chaldees. He called him to a place, to a land that he would show him. Now Abraham, and he, he called him to leave his father's house, right? Now Abraham heard the call he obeyed the call in part, but he didn't obey it fully. He didn't leave his father's house. He took his father with him. And he went to Haran, not to Canaan. Check it out. Genesis 12 through 14 through 15. But then his father Terah died. And then God came again and called him a second time. And Abram heard them. And this time he moved to Canaan. Not to escape. It wasn't to escape the idolatry of Ur of the Chaldees. Because where God was taking him was more idolatrous than that. He was parking them right next door to Sodom and Gomorrah. And there, in the land that God would show to him the land of Canaan. That's where he should have been the first time. But the call came to him twice. So we too, you know, times um, we can be spiritually deaf or spiritual hearing can be a, a little bit faulty. And sometimes, you know, we think that, well, God will, God will be satisfied with halfway, you know. Just take my dad with him and just go to Haran, not all the way to Canaan. Halfway house. No, 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 no. The full nine yards. What God commands, we obey. Thirdly, and finally, the secondary cause, verses 9 through 11. You looked for much, and though it came to little, and when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, said the Lord of hosts, because of mine house there is waste, and you run every man unto his own house. And on to verse 11. Contrary to what they were thinking and saying, God was with them. He is never without his people. Never leaves us, never forsakes us. Always with us. He was with the people in Haggai's day. But he was working amongst them. Amongst them and he was blighting everything that they did. God was the secondary cause behind these circumstances that they were faced with. 
He is the efficient cause of everything, everything I see that happens in his universe, in his world, and amongst us, his people. He's not a godlet. He is the Lord of hosts, as Haggai keeps um, referring to him. He's a God who has angelic powers at his disposal, human powers at his disposal, creatures great and small, millions, billions, hosts at his disposal to do his will, sovereign will. He's sovereign in creation, he's sovereign in redemption, and he's sovereign in providence too. Psalm 148, verse 8. Fire and hail, snow and vapor, stormy wind, fulfilling his word at his disposal, at his behest, they do his bidding. So these circumstances Israel's faced with, there's a cause, there's a secondary cause, and it's God. I, I sent the drought. I caused the drought. I caused the famine. It was me. I caused your exile for 70 years, and then I reversed it. I caused it. I caused it all. I caused everything. I'm the efficient cause of everything. I caused viruses. I caused pandemics. I, I, at the word of my command, at my will, bring the world to a standstill and to economic ruin by means of a tiny, invisible little virus that nobody can see and deal with. In order to bring his people to reality, to awaken them, to open their eyes, because there's times when as God's people we can be as blind as bats. We can be as deaf as doorposts. And so sometimes God takes nature, as we would call it, and causes nature to testify against our disobedience. Our apathy, our indifference to the building of God's house. And so he brings even the forces of nature against us to testify against us that our ways are not right. Romans 1 and verse 19 uh, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for God hath showed it unto them for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Creation, nature as men calls it, are a testimony to God, to his existence, to his power, to his divinity. And of course his wrath is revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men because of their what? Their wickedness, because of their departure from God, because of their living their lives. Oh, professing, professing to know God, yeah? confessing God, confessing the name of Jesus Christ, but living as if there was no God. Psalm 14, verse 1 testifies to the wrath of God and the evil of man. But there's no saving power in God's nature, in God's creation. There's no saving power apart from the sovereign, free, particular grace of God. So today's famine, Today's famine, Amos, Amos chapter 8 and verse 11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, not a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. That's today's famine. That's today's famine. Not hearing, hearing, but not heeding the word of God. Not building the house of God. 
not carrying on with the work of reformation, reforming doctrine, reforming life, the preaching, faithful preaching of God's word, the sharp, sound preaching of God's word, the proper administration of the sacraments, church discipline, the building of God's house, and sometimes those times of famine that God sends of the hearing and heeding of his word, they can be very long. Think of the centuries prior to the Reformation, medieval times, darkness, complete darkness for many years, centuries, until the time of the Reformation and the light dawned once again. But now the tide is going out in the West in particular of the gospel I mean and now we have churches we have churches that are devoid of the word of God music churches music 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 all the music you can handle you can deal with whatever kind any variety rock and roll uh, uh, rap music you name it Churches where the word of God is sung and preached, but unheard, unheard. The people get out the door, get in their cars before they've got home and they're sat down at the dinner table on a Sunday lunchtime. It's forgotten what was preached. We've never had so much in terms of, 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 of things pertaining to God and to his kingdom. Bibles, versions, you name it, you've got it. Uh, multiple versions of the Bible. Any better for it? I suggest not. Not one whit. Worse, I would say. Uh, we've got the internet. We've got access to sermons, to lectures. You name it, we've got it right at our fingertips. Just switch the machine on and ping, you've got it right there before you. You don't even have to go looking for it, searching for it, digging for it. It's all just lying on the surface. Never have we had so much, and yet never has so little fruit come from it. You look for much, and lo, it came to little. Hmm? You look for much, and lo, it came to little. Consider your ways. Little profit. Little profit, little blessing. Little peace, little joy. Little of the glorious presence and power of God amongst us. So very little of the true knowledge of God. And what we do do, God blows on it, and it's gone. But because, because it's not the outward forces, it's not the external forces, don't blame the pandemic. Don't blame your government's handling of the pandemic. Don't blame the international turmoil. Don't blame the enemies without. The problem, the whole problem is, is inward, is the heart. Disobedience to God's word, disinterest in building the house of God. And so the call comes to us again, the second time. The first time, verse 5, Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. And then again in verse 7, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Consider him. Consider him who bought you at such great price, who came down into this world, made of a woman, made under the law to deliver us from the law from his power and condemnation. Jesus Christ and him crucified, the one of whom this is about, the temple builder. 
and the one who wants to get on with building his house and wants his people by his side, building, building, building his house. We belong to him, our faithful, faithful covenant Lord. And because of what he has done for us and in us and what he has given to us, he deserves and we owe, we have a debt of gratitude towards him to be moving, to be up and moving, action, action, action. Time to repent, time for renewed faith, and time for renewed obedience. Consider your ways. Amen.